Hey everybody, it's the Art of Motion Garage Podcast, welcome back, episode number four. Oh yeah. What's up everybody, hope everybody had a good weekend, it's Tuesday, uh, which is awesome because it's not Monday, and I uh, hope everybody had fun at Edge Day this weekend, looked uh, like a lot of fun, I wasn't there, but uh looked like a lot of fun, so what are we going to do this week? I think this week I'm going to talk about my car, which is uh, my Integra. Uh, It would be nice to just get you guys up to date on it uh, and give it a little intro and just a bit of history on it because I think it's pretty interesting. So what I'm holding here is the owner's manual. The whole booklet, complete with original window sticker to my car. You hear that? Oh, yeah. That's me pulling the window sticker out of the owner's manual. Uh, All this stuff is in, like, perfect condition, pretty much. Uh, A lot of people, I feel like, don't have this much history, documented history with uh, with their Hondas. I mean, everybody knows these cars were kind of just, like, stolen all the time and gone through a million hands. Uh, and so you never really know what you're going to get. But uh, you're never going to know what you're going to get. But unfortunately, I do know pretty much from the dealer when it was sold brand new what it's been up to all the way up until I got it. And obviously I know everything I did with it. So the car's an 01, which is the last model year for, as you guys know, is the DC2, DC4, DC chassis. And it's an LS coupe, satin silver metallic, fall over at, Art of Motion Garage on Instagram. There's plenty of pictures of it. And all the stuff that I've been doing to it. And yeah, it's been a great car. So I got the car in May of 2014. So almost four years ago, exactly. And uh, I bought it from the second owner's. Now, these people, they were a young couple. They had it just for like three years maybe, and they bought it from the original owners who had it for 10 years before that, and they bought it brand new. Like I said, I'm in Vermont, and they lived in southern Vermont, more towards New Hampshire, and they bought it from an Acura dealership in New Hampshire. And the one interesting thing that I was... I mean, saved the car's life, was the original owners never drove it in the winter. Now, up here in Vermont, our winters absolutely destroy cars from the snow and the salt and all the muck just all winter long. It totally destroys cars, especially Hondas. Eats these things alive. So that first 10 years of not seeing any of that for sure helped it. Now, that being said, the people I bought it from drove it in the winter for three years. So, by the time I got it, there was stuff starting to form um, rust-wise a little bit underneath. And it hadn't quite got to the quarter panels yet, which is, you know, as everyone knows, typical... Honda rust is the rear wheel wells so when I went to look at the car those were the first things I looked at and there was nothing bad surface rust underneath but I mean nothing that really was important to the structure of the car or anything like that 
In fact, I've been spending the last year and a half totally disassembled the car underneath to fix what I can, re-undercoated everything, changed all the fuel and brake lines, all the suspension bushings, the wheel bearings, the ball joints, all that stuff. So I'll get into that later. But when I got it, it was just on the cusp of like, if you kept going in the winter with it, that thing would have been toast. The car was super clean. And uh, so there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to not pick it up. So here's the story how I got it. I had a bagged S10 at the time that I bought from a coworker. Sweet S10. Uh, had the whole bed shaved, tailgate shaved, roll pan molded into the thing. The whole nine, it was sweet. I got it for a sweet deal. And this was after I got rid of my previous EK project, which some of you may know, uh, it was pretty extensive. I couldn't get it done, so I had to get rid of it. It was gone. Bought this S10 with the money. It was something I could get in, hop in. It was a mini truck, which I've kind of always wanted to mess around with. And so I had that for a little while. Wanted another Honda almost immediately. So I put the S10 up for sale. Took a, took a couple of months to get rid of. Ended up selling it to a guy from Maryland. So he came up here to get it. That was on a Saturday. I sold it for four grand. And because it took me so long to sell this S10, I kind of already had my eyes peeled uh, on Honda's on Craigslist. So I knew what was out there, and I sold the S10 on a Saturday. The next morning, I was like, I was on it. And for the past few months since I've been keeping my eyes peeled with Honda's, I kept seeing this silver Integra just keep getting reposted and reposted and I was thinking like man why has nobody bought this car and the pictures it looks super clean it's an LS so that probably has something to do with it they wanted a little bit much for it but over a period of three or four months I kept seeing the price go down on it by hundreds five six seven hundred dollars like kept going down so by the time I had cash in my hand I was just itching for something, and that one was still up there. So I called the number, of course, and that this was the Sunday. So literally the next day after I sold that S10, I was like on the hunt trying to get something home. And so I called the number. They answered. I asked them about it, and they said, we have someone coming to look at it this afternoon who's uh pretty ready to buy it if they don't buy it we'll let you know hung up the phone i said shit this car has been on craigslist for months and months and now when i have money to buy it she gone so a couple hours go by i don't hear anything i want this dang car <laughs> i'm like ready to get something so i call them back and they said, oh, yeah, the person came. They didn't want it. First off, in my head, I was like, okay. I literally told you I would buy the car cash today. Why wouldn't you call me back if another deal fell through? So that's in my head. And we agreed on a $3,000 price. Because the car is pretty clean. And I was ready to get something. So that's they said they'd take three for it. Cash the right then and there, we we are on the road, and so I said, "All right, well, can I come look at the car right now? If if I like it, I will buy it on the spot." They agreed. They lived pretty close to where I just sold the truck the day before, which was a couple hour drive. So they met me an hour, an hour in, because I explained to them, "Look, I was just down there yesterday. Whatever, I sold this truck. Blah blah blah." So they agree. I'm, I, I meet them, and I see the car, and I go, wow, this thing's clean. 
First thing I check is the rear wheel wells. All original, just surface rust, just starting to bubble the paint over. So I say, ah, oh, no big deal at all. I look underneath it to look for any rust. It was uh, by Northern Standards, pretty clean for the age of the car. I tried to get a look at like the fuel and brake lines because those things are one of the first things to go under there. It didn't look too bad. I said, bam, here's your money. Give me this thing. Drove it back home, was stoked. I was like, couldn't believe that I found a car of this age um, in this condition, a northern car its whole life. They explained to me, you know, they bought it from the first owner. They gave me a big stack of receipts of all the work that's been done either by them or by the first owner. This car was all original, all OEM. Nobody's ever touched it. The one thing it had done was a head unit and uh, component speakers. And I had the receipt for that because they had Geek Squad at Best Buy put the whole, put the whole thing in. So that was the only thing done to that car. And that alone these days with any Honda is just super rare. Every sing- it seems like every single one has been torn apart, the engine taken out, you know, a new one put in, stolen, all the stuff taken off and put back on, no original panels, this and that. This car had all matching numbers, as goofy as that sounds. All the body panels have the VIN tags on them. I have the owner manual, owner's manual with the window sticker on it. So... That's where I, where I started. So I was stoked to have a Honda again. And uh, naturally, I looked over the car, you know, I'm a mechanic, so I, I took it to work the next day and put it on the lift and was just shocked about how clean it was. But I also saw some areas that needed attention. But as most would, I ignored that right away, and I said, all right, what am I, what's my first mod here? What am I doing? I still had some money left over from the sale of the truck. So I was like, all right, I'm lowering it. So that was the first thing I did was get Skunk 2 Springs, which dropped at 1.8 in the rear and 2 in the front, something like that. And uh, True Heart Sport Shocks. Now, at the time, in 2014, I'd never heard of True Heart before. It seemed to be like a new company. The struts were reasonably priced, and they were sport shocks, so they were stiffer than, you know, buying OEM replacements and putting the shocks, or the springs, rather, on those, which I definitely, you know, doing some research, definitely a smarter idea. If you're going to use lowering springs to put them on stiffer sport shocks. All the shocks I could find, you know, were a little bit out of my range at the time. But I definitely wasn't trying to, you know, hack this thing up and put some bullshit on it. So I found, I came across the True Hearts and they were like 72 bucks a strut which is great for a sport shock and i was like i've never heard of this company before who knows how this is going to turn out but you know let's just roll with it and they're still on the car today they've been great and it definitely seems like true heart is one of those companies that uh has come a long way and they make all sorts of stuff now and they seem to be uh i haven't heard too many bad things about them i'm sure there's some but you know, it's working well for me. So that was the first thing I did was lower it. And not alone, the car. It was just night and day. And uh, so some of my... So right after that, I mean, I drove it around for that summer. And I was like, man, this thing is a dog. Because let's face it. A total stock B18B in an Integra is... not Nothing to write home about as far as acceleration and power and torque. 
especially with the you know long gear transmission it was just like a dog so i had to do something naturally uh i had turbos dancing in my head turbo 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 uh so i started thinking of that because we all know that you know ls's handle boost pretty well in stock form slap a head gasket and some arp head studs in it so the head doesn't lift under boost and you know you can you can get some pretty decent numbers out of that for relatively cheap at the time i had a friend with a crx who had a b20 turbo in that was getting ready to go k swap on that so he was parting out his current setup so i came and he uh Cut me, uh, cut me a deal on the S300 and a tile wastegate from that setup because I was, you know, trying to think of in my head and piece together, uh, you know, a kit and stuff for relatively cheap. But still, you know, something decent. So... Now, here's where some of you guys are going to lose me. Oh, or, yeah, what what does that even mean? So here's where, you know, some of you guys are going to be like, oh, man, I bought an eBay turbo kit. I had a couple friends that had some good luck with them, including this guy, Tyler, in a CRX. I said, look. I just want something conservative. I'm not going to be, you know, Brian Earl spillering it every single day. I'll change out, you know, the wastegate for a legit wastegate. Have it tuned by Jeff Evans at Evans Tuning. You know, it should hold up for a while. Because I... Didn't want the fastest thing. I just want wanted that thing to have a little bit more to lug it around town. And so that's what I did. I ordered one of those Godspeed T3, T4 turbo kits from eBay. Chucked the, you know, fake Turbo Smart knockoff wastegate. Chucked that out. Put this tile 38 millimeter in with that. I got the one the kit with the cast manifold, so I wouldn't have any problems with, you know, those uh, other eBay kits that have the stainless steel ram horn manifolds that like to crack. So I knew, you know, that was relatively safe to run the cast log manifold, so I wouldn't have many problems there. Hopefully, uh, I checked the fake. HKS blow off valve out and I was able to source a used authentic one online for like 90 bucks or something like that so that weak link went out uh, ran the turbo with it and got some DSM injectors wired in a resistor box AM fuel pressure regulator Walboro 255 Competition stage three clutch. Catch can with uh, dash 12 and lines. So I put that together over the winter of 2014. Went and got that uh, tuned in May down in Pennsylvania. So that was the thing. I put my tuning deposit into Jeff Evans at Evans Tuning. He sent me a base map. I sent him all my specs of my setup. And uh, so he sent me a map back, loaded it up, got everything ready to go, got the car running, driving, put about 600 miles on it to make sure there were no kinks I needed to work out and to break the clutch in. Car on the first fire with that base map, that car ran like an OEM car. It was like, it was crazy. 
Now, obviously, you know, nothing was really played with, so I couldn't, you know, full throttle it anywhere. But the car definitely, you could have daily driven on that map if you if you weren't trying to put your foot into it. It ran that well. I was like, wow, this is crazy. So the morning of my t- tuning appointment came. My now wife, who was then my girlfriend, uh, she drove down with me. So we left at 5 in the morning up in Vermont. Takes about six hours or so to get there. So we left at 5. We got there around 11 or so. My appointment was for 1. He uh, tuned it. So we just come off the road. Car sat for maybe an hour. He put it on his hub dynos. Ran six, six pulls six or seven pulls through it and uh because my exhaust is super undersized i knew that going into it was dumb but you know i kind of ran out of resources at that point so it had a two and a half inch uh down pipe with a oh and i'm running an innovative or innovate wideband gauge through that wired into s300 and then a two and a quarter inch cat back an old school comp tech cat back that uh i got from another coworker, and so he was going listen it's taking too much boost to make you know power because the exhaust is such a restriction we're gonna we're gonna stop it here and so we stopped at 250 horsepower and 235 foot pounds of torque which I was like, all right, that's conservative. It's just enough to wake the thing up a bit, but it's not gonna, you know, blow up. Because uh, you know, I'm at the I'm at the top of my my limit here with the stock LS. So he said, well, uh, I'll set this up so you can run a high boost and a low boost. So you just pin, you know, uh, just a toggle switch to this wire. And on low boost, you're going to just come off the wastegate at 8 pounds and make 200 horse and 200 foot pounds to the wheels, which, you know, is nice. And then you can hit the switch and have the full 14 pounds uh, with 250 horse and 235 foot pounds of torque because I also wired in uh, the boost solenoid so, you know, I could run boost by gear. And he set that up. And uh, that's how the car is set up today. That whole summer ran awesome. Uh, I have never had a problem with that car. The eBay Turbo, you know, I always kept an eye on it, make sure it's not uh, starting to leak oil out of the bearings or, or anything like that. And so that car was good. Uh, I also, so after that, I ran the car for a couple years, did some other stuff to it, like, uh, did some tucking here and there, deleted ABS and, you know, used RS brake lines and prop valve, got some Enki RPF ones on that bad boy, Dunlop, Dereza tires. Uh, just some other stuff here and there. And uh, so I also rebuilt the turbo. So there was no problems with it, but I thought there may have been, you know, a little bit too much shaft play. So what I did was totally disassemble it. And I did some research on, you know, who would rebuild it for me or how I could rebuild it myself. And I came across the G-Pop shop. <clears throat> now, these guys really uh, were awesome through the whole thing. They sell T3, T4 rebuild kits and upgraded kits at that with 360-degree uh, thrust bearings or thrust washers and upgraded bearings, this and that. So I bought one of their kits for about 100 bucks. Totally disassembled the turbo. They gave you a spec sheet on you know measuring everything and make sure... Everything's good to go to put their uh, bearings and 
thrust washers and all that stuff back in. Everything measured great, put it back together. Stoked. And then I sent it to them to have it computer balanced. Now, that is super important because with uh, most, if not all of these Chinese turbos, that is the underlying factor of why most of these wear out because they're not balanced. Balancing them what they means they would mean need another machine, more labor, more money, the things would cost more, whatever. So um all that went back together, balanced it, they said it was perfect. Now here we are after that, after I've rebuilt all the suspension, all the other stuff, I'm getting ready to get this thing back on the road this year. And uh, that's where we'll see how I did and how that thing holds up. But with that little bit of money thrown into the turbo, that in theory should be just as good as any T3, T4 from, you know, a more quality brand should don't know if it will be but it should and i didn't have any problems with it in the past and now everything's upgraded and balanced you know we'll see how that goes so uh i'm stoked for that but let's do a little reading here on the the window sticker now like i said this car was all original all original engine with the vintag transmission has the vintag it's not swapped because I the window sticker proves because it has the however many digit code that is under the engine code on the block. So if anyone wants to doubt me on that, uh, too bad because I got the proof. And I, I didn't tell you guys the mileage. Dumb me. That's one of the first things I should have said. When I bought the car, I had 189,000 miles on it. You would have never known it. This car, I mean, it just—it was never abused. Unfortunately, of course, I've abused it a little bit, but not not too bad. I I take take pretty well, pretty good care of my stuff, especially when it comes to my vehicles. I change the oil every fifteen hundred miles in this car. I don't even drive it in the rain, let alone the winter. Uh, so I'm continuing the love for this car that the other owners had for it. Uh, but yeah, I had 189,000 on it has 193 on it. Now I've had it almost four years. So that shows you how much it's really been driven sitting in the garage for the past year and a half now, but that car ran and still does run like a dream. So before I boosted it, I was like, all right, maybe I should uh, do a compression test on it. And if the numbers are good, I'm boosting. I did a compression test on it, and the all four cylinders were literally within like two or three PSI of each other, and they were all at like the top of Honda spec, which was... Uh, 180 psi or something like that which uh, makes sense because it's lower compression it's not like I think the spec for the VTEC ones are like whatever 210 to 220 psi in the cylinders so this one's lower because it's uh, lower compression makes perfect sense they were, they were all all the results were at the top of the range for honda spec so i was going to town so i put arp head studs in it and a chromatic gasket oem uh timing belt kit with a water pump change some seals front and rear main seals cam seals cam plug all that ready to go so anyways, on the window sticker. This is super interesting to have this from this time. 
Like I said, this car was an 01, so it's like 17 years old now. So the MSRP on this car in 2001, keep that in mind, is $19,880. For the time, that is pretty dang expensive. I wonder what that would work out to be in today's dollars. Let's do this real quick. Nineteen thousand eight hundred eighty dollars. Two thousand one to now. Let's see what we come up with. Inflation calculator. Nineteen thousand eight hundred. Wow. So if you convert that nineteen thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars in two thousand one to twenty seventeen, that comes out to twenty seven thousand four hundred and seventy seven dollars. That's a pretty expensive car. And think of that. I bought it four years ago. So just what? 13 years later, I paid three grand for it. How depreciating is buying a car sometimes? (laughs) And that's, so that's an LS. So if you look at it this way, a 2001 Type R, whatever the sticker back then was, we're like, I don't know, 25 something. And now those things are going for 30 plus. Like you're making insane amounts of money on that car. As opposed to this car losing just about its full value. That's crazy. But anyways, more on the window sticker. So it says technical features. 140 horse power 1.8 liter dual overhead cam 16 valve 4 cylinder engine 5 speed manual 4 wheel disc brakes double wish bone suspension I wish the Honda uh, window sticker still said that on it load sensing power assisted rack and pinion steering That sounds so complicated for the day, but uh, it's a power rack with a pressure sensor on it. Man, that's funny. Front and rear stabilizer bars, gas pressurized shock absorbers, 100,000 mile, no scheduled tune-ups. And then it says in parentheses, under normal conditions. So cool. Safety feature, features, drivers and front, passenger airbags, anti-lock brakes, front and rear crumple zones, side impact door beams, immobilizer. Very cool. Now, down here, it says parts content information. 95% of it is from Japan and 5% is U.S. or Canadian's part content. I have a feeling that's a lot less these days. Final assembly point, Suzuka, Japan. Oh, dang. Very cool. Now, here's the fuel economy information. City is 25 miles a gallon. Highway is 31. Estimated annual fuel cost $723. Oh, here's the warranty information. MSRP includes four-year, 50,000-mile limited vehicle warranty, five years unlimited mile outer body rust-through warranty, so a five-year rust warranty on the body. Lifetime seatbelt warranty. Wow. Accurate total 
Luxury Care. I do not know what that is. TLC, y'all. I see what you did there, you motherfuckers. Okay. Go ahead, Honda with the acronyms. Toll-free customer assistance, 24-hour roadside assistance, and concierge service. And $480 for the shipping. So that's how you arrive at the $19,880 MSRP. So cool. And the interior is ebony. Ex interior ebony. Exterior, satin, silver, metallic. And then my VIN number, engine number. Uh, maybe this will be worth something someday. Probably not. Because I, I had to go in and mess it all up. With my riser shit, bruh. But yeah, I'll post pictures of this on Instagram after I finish this uh, this episode. But yeah, that's the window sticker. And that's a bit of the history of my Integra. Now, uh, so I'm getting ready to get it back on the road this year. This is what I've done. Uh, I wasn't on the road last year because, you know, I'm a mechanic. And... When I'm mechanicing all day, a lot of the times it's hard for me to come home and mechanic in my garage. So it's taken me a little longer than it would if I did something else. But I got to say, it's almost totally different from what I do at work. Coming home, no time constraints. I'm not just repairing and servicing cars back to how you know the manufacturer wants. I'm kind of engineering something myself and selecting the parts to do that and make that happen, which is a hell of a lot more fun, but it's still wrenching on cars, which I do all day. So sometimes, you know, it's a little hard to get motivated, especially when it comes to messing around with rusty suspension and fuel lines and all that sort of stuff on my back with jacks, not, you know, on a dope lift at work wheeling all my tools around with me like nah total different thing but anyway so this is what i've done in preparation of you know i want to keep this car for a very long time so i've just kind of been taking it little by little area by area focusing on one spot and kind of getting that to where i want it this happened to be the hole underneath of the car so what I did is totally disassemble everything underneath the car, remove the subframe, the trailing arms, fuel lines, brake lines, gas tank, all that stuff, down to the bare body. Like I said, this car started to get a little rusty from being a northern car, but nothing that was serious. So I started there, wire wheeled the hole underneath of it, to get as much as that surface rust out, put some uh, rust encapsulating or what is it? What was it? Rust converter. So that supposedly stops the rust, dries into a finish that you can directly paint right over. So I sprayed that on the areas I wired wheeled. Then got some products from Eastwood. Now, I had no idea how much stuff Eastwood make or Eastwood makes when it comes to everything. Not just the fender roller. They make, I mean, tools, all sorts of stuff, chemicals. So I bought a few cans of their rust encapsulating rubberized undercoating. Did the hole underneath the car. So there, the hole underneath looks nice. Then, as I put everything back underneath, I replaced all the brake lines and fuel lines. Now, the trick there is Acura discontinued the OEM already pre-bent lines. Mine were rusted, and definitely when I took them apart, they almost fell apart in my hands, which is scary when you're coming to your brakes and fuel. And... Especially after, you know, you just double the car's power. That shit needed to be addressed. As dirty and crappy of a job that is, it had to get done. So anyways, they were still strong enough to where I could, I could trace the lines. So what I did was bought steel line, all hand bent it all, and uh, traced the OEM lines 
and match them up as best I could. So not perfect, but they pre- they uh, pretty much fit pretty OEM. Uh, so I did that. Put all those back, uh, cleaned up the gas tank because I had a little bit rust here or there on it. So undercoated all that, made all the lines, put that back together, then refinished, took all the trailing arms apart, refinished those, replaced all the rear trailing arm bushings. I replaced the upper control arms with OEM ones, did a hard, hard race toe bushings in the toe arms. The rear lower control arms were factory, but I already put energy suspension bushings in them because when I went to lower it, of course, as many of you know, the bolts like the C's into the bushings, that happened, got rid of all the bushings, replaced them with polyurethane ones, so that finishes out the rear. New uh, rear wheel bearings, calipers all the way around, Um, had the spindles. Separating those from the trailing arm was a bitch with those T50 or 55 bolts. You can't buy those bolts. I had to cut and like drill a bunch of mine out. And I replaced them with high grade bolts with Loctite on them. I had the spindles, they were pretty crusty. So I had them sandblasted by, a, by someone, painted those up, put everything back together. Uh, all the front bushings, front lower control arm bushings, front upper control arms are new. Um, sway bar end links, all that stuff. So this thing should handle pretty dang good afterwards. Because I noticed, you know, the suspension just getting softer. And that's probably from doubling the car's horsepower on all these crappy bushings, which is a recipe for disaster if you if you let it go that way. So I like to take my time and uh, fix all that stuff. But uh, that... Uh, so I'm really getting excited to get that back on the road, and that should happen soon. So that's a little bit of a history with my car and now kind of where it's headed. So from there, I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm going to continue to put all this love into it and uh, keep it safe in my garage. And that's that. Let's move on to this. Now, I really want to shout out to uh, Christian Perez, Honda Vlogs. Go follow him at Honda Vlogs on Instagram and at Honda Vlogs on YouTube. Super nice dude. Been talking back and forth with him. Enjoy his content. I love what he's doing. Inspired this podcast, too, quite a bit. But uh, shout out to him, man, because he's a good dude. I like his Del Sol, and I like uh, his sort of poetic history with it. And... That's the kind of thing I'm a, I'm about and want to push forward with. So thank you, Christian, for uh, all your support so far. And keep it up, brother. Now, that concludes this episode this week. Uh, look for this on YouTube. I've been posting them up on YouTube, so you can listen there. Uh, iTunes, of course. And on other platforms soon, hopefully, after Christian told me about the Anchor app, which uh, is an easy way to start a podcast. And that if you host with them, they kind of put your stuff up everywhere, which is good. Shout out again to Christian for that. Thanks a ton, man. Uh, I'm gonna get in, I'm gonna get on that. And as always, follow along on Instagram at Art of Motion Garage, and we will see you next week.